Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Oxygen Not Included. Today, I've got another experiment for you. Today, we're taking a look at the evaporation of polluted water into polluted oxygen and then converting that polluted oxygen into nice, clean, easy to breathe, oxygen. Now, this is in direct response to one of my previous challenges where I was doing the triple printer challenge, which is all revolving around bringing in as many duplicates or basically one duplicate per cycle. And ultimately, I need a lot of oxygen very, very rapidly. So I need to pull oxygen from every source possible. One of those is polluted water. Now, this is an old idea. So it actually was sparked up from a conversation here with Von Weil, who, who posted several different builds and things that I could potentially put inside the base, as along with many, many of you guys were recommending different things for that challenge, but that's not really what this one's about. And the Bond Finrier, even though I messed up your name, sorry about that. This is actually an old, old strategy of using that polluted water and then having it bubble off. However, the big thing that has changed between now or relatively now or in the last couple of updates and where it was a long time ago is the addition of the rock granulator and that produces a lot a lot of sand and we can also cook dirt and all of that stuff back into sand so it's easy to get a lot more sand now than it was a while ago so therefore it's actually feasible to use a deodorizer to convert polluted oxygen into clean oxygen and we'll be looking at some of the numbers there now when it comes to actually bubbling off uh, so we say, if, let's just look at the property of evaporating polluted water. Now I've already done some, you know, the base level science at this point. So I'm going to share you my share those results with you. But this is kind of a, a proof of concept to show you what I have set up here and how it could potentially lay out inside of your base. So over here we have polluted water, and above that is some polluted oxygen. So you can see that there's. 768 kilograms in that area right there and then there's 31.3 kilograms worth of polluted oxygen above it and this just continues to evaporate and evaporate and making more and more polluted oxygen despite whatever the pressures are it works so over here we have the same sort of idea with a lot more, with a lot more polluted oxygen there and then you can also do fun things like use airflow tiles to repulse liquids or in this case use them to trap liquids without actually touching walls. Now there's some interesting dynamics that go on with which way does water or so we say the polluted water, which way does it actually evaporate? Does it only evaporate up? Can it evaporate to the right or down or to the left? The answer is actually kind of surprising. So that's the same sort of idea. Could you create a tank like this and just let it bubble off in every direction? Because in this, this is a very efficient way to store lots of polluted water at a relatively low mm, pressure, I should say, or low mass. We can see this is 963 kilograms per tile right there. The other way is you could potentially put this right into the floor and use your floor as a tank by just using mesh tile and then a floor tile beneath that. The neat thing there is that you can control the temperature of that liquid and then affect the gas of your base or the, the, temper the temperature of the gases inside your base accordingly by just using basically a floor evaporation system, which is not really all that different from the concept of like a swamp cooler. So <laughs> that's kind of cool. It's actually a straight up like real life thing, but we don't necessarily just pour water on the floor inside of our houses. So now that we have some sort of understanding of what's going on here, we ha what are the variables that we have to basically science out of this? We have to do some research. Well, that's what I have up here. This is kind of a test bed where I set up many different things, right? So in this area over here, I have uh, the difference or the the understanding of the difference in the mass or per tile, right? So what we have here is 50 kilograms in one single tile over here is 500 kilograms. So does that produce 10 times the amount of polluted oxygen above it? There's also a seed gas that is already up there in order for things to um, essentially start evaporating. So what we have over here is different gases above the, the liquid. So in each one of these is 500 kilograms of liquid. And above here is a vacuum. And then we have oxygen, carbon dioxide, chlorine, hydrogen, and polluted oxygen. So do any of these gases stop polluted water from evaporating into polluted oxygen? That's what that test is all about. 
between this tile and this tile right here, there's a difference of 100 degrees Celsius, or really close to it. So that is a, a difference in temperature. So we want to understand if a higher temperature water, so we say a polluted water, will actually evaporate at a higher rate. That's the difference right there. Then we have over here, we have a higher, um, even higher mass per tile, which is 5,000 kilograms. Now I know that that's gonna cause a problem. So I'm gonna go ahead and that would, I actually did this test. We'll, I'll jump right to the results here in a second. And I, I did that at 2,000 kilograms because at 5,000 it just explodes the tiles. So essentially this is going to be four times as much liquid as compared to this tile right here. So that's kind of the same test from here to here from and then from here to here. And this is simulating the idea of using a super compressor setup where we can actually compress liquids, which is possible within this game by using a series of doors compressing down polluted water, you know, into a, a tighter space than it would otherwise be able to fit. Down here is another functional setup, and this is the amount of water exposed to a different amount of gas up here. So what are these results and how does that work? And everything besides this tile right here is tested at zero degrees Celsius. So the freezing point of polluted water is negative 20.6 degrees Celsius and its evaporation point um, from that to, a, to steam is actually at 119.4 degrees. So it's kind of interesting that once it technically evaporates due to temperature, it turns into steam. However, if you just let it kind of bubble off, it'll turn into polluted oxygen. So if I fast forward now 10 cycles, we'll see the actual results of that experiment right there. I just let it run for 10 cycles. No, no big deal. I mean, all we're sitting, all we're doing there is just watching little puddles of polluted water bubble off. I mean, it's not all that dramatic. All right, so here we are 10 cycles into the future. So looking at a first tile here, we have 49.1 kilograms of liquid. So 0.9 kilograms has disappeared and you can see it mostly has made its way up here above that. So that is 943 grams. However, then we did start with 100. So it's 843 grams that was created, you know, right there over 10 cycles. And we see the same sort of story play out throughout all of these gases. So right here we can see polluted water. This is 490 kilograms. And then above that is 10 kilograms right there. So everything is more or less bubbling off at a one-to-one -one ratio. However, the liquid over here that is a little bit warmer actually produced a little bit more polluted oxygen. So right off the bat, I can see that there's a slight difference when you consider temperature. So looking at the super compressed liquid over here, we can see that you know this started at 2000 in this particular test. And you can see that it, it is actually reduced quite a bit more than the other stuff. So we can see, uh, look by looking at the results here, which I kind of have to move on over to the chart now. You can see this is what we had, 50, 500, 500 at 100 C. And what we see here is gain of kilograms per cycle was actually averaged out to 4.3 kilograms per cycle. So it's actually a fair bit higher and it's four times as much. So right off the bat, by just comparing those four simple little experiments, what I can see is that Polluted water converts into polluted oxygen at a one-to-one -one ratio. So for every gram of polluted water you have, it equates to an equal parts of polluted oxygen. The other thing I notice is that it's consistent with the amount of polluted water in that tile. So this over here produced 10 times as much, and this over here was four times as much, and it produced at least four times as much. So you can super compress your liquid down into one tile right there and still produce just as much as if you were to spread that out. However, there are some other things that we're going to see here. At what directions can this thing actually evaporate? So looking at this sort of, you know, gravity defying chunk of polluted water here, what we can see is that polluted oxygen made its way up and it also made its way to the left. However, it did not really make its way to the right, even though it was seated over there and it didn't go down. So it went up and to the left. Hmm. So what we can see there is the additional surface area that that polluted water was exposed to increased its production by about 50%. So this was 1.56 whatever kilograms per cycle. 
So that's really impressive. All right, so let's take a look at this from a little different perspective here. So looking at our normal test here, which was the 500 kilogram at zero degrees Celsius, simple test right there. So that was, that was this one. That had a conversion rate of the liquid that was inside that tile at 0.2%, you know, per cycle. Uh, if you were to increase the temperature there, you gained 0.05%. So that took it up to 0.25. And then the direction test, which was the extra area, that brought it up another 0.05%. So that right there is a very, very small percentage. So how does that actually equate out to, you know, me being able to produce a meaningful amount of polluted oxygen and then converting that into oxygen? Well, in this test down here, we had 20%, 50%, and then 100% uh, more or less polluted water exposed to polluted oxygen, this being 500 kilograms per tile. So there's actually different amounts of liquid there. But what we have is basically two kilograms gained per cycle, about five kilograms gained per cycle, and then roughly about 10 kilograms gained per cycle right there. So at 500 kilograms in a tile down there below, which is a nice safe number, it's not gonna bubble over and cause people to get soggy feet or anything like that you know, you get about one kilogram per tile right there. And honestly, that doesn't sound like a lot of oxygen when you consider that your duplicant consumes about 60 kilograms of oxygen per cycle. And if you look at a deodorizer, it is capable of producing 54 kilograms of oxygen per day at the cost of 80 kilograms of sand. However, you do get that back in clay, so you can actually use that to expand your farm and fun stuff like that. So that really doesn't sound like a lot of oxygen. However, let's take a look at this pool right down here. Now I kind of already counted up about how much liquid is in this pool alone. And what you have there is you have enough polluted oxygen to produce 76.8 kilograms of polluted oxygen a day. So if you take that number, right, and you multiply that by 0.9, what you end up with is 69 kilograms of oxygen a day. And when you zoom back out and get the larger picture of just how much polluted oxygen water is in your base, what you start to realize is that there is a lot, a whole lot of polluted water around. Now, if all you're doing is storing this polluted water, you might as well go ahead and can, you know, get some oxygen out of it. So there is enough here if we take this pool just eyeballing it and you know that might be another duplicant and then if you kind of add this up you might get three duplicants worth of oxygen a day four five i mean it, it starts to add up however that's a lot a lot of volume and it only works if you can lay it out you know in such a way that it either evaporates up or to the left so let's set up a piece of equipment here that's really going to maximize both the volume and the ability to convert that into polluted oxygen. And on one final note here, exposed to different types of gases, it didn't really matter as long as it wasn't right next to a vacuum, which is pretty hard to set up. So, you know, if it's next to oxygen, boom, you're going to get polluted oxygen, you know, bubbling off of this liquid. Same with carbon dioxide. Same with polluted oxygen, obviously. Same with hydrogen, and same with chlorine. So, doesn't really matter. As long as it's, ne it's next to a gas, it'll start bubbling off. All right, so here I have two different setups. On the top, I have a super compressor setup with the idea that this hydro sensor will become active at above 500 kilograms. That will then send a signal through the doors here, which will open up this door very, very quickly. The liquid will drop down and then it will, you know, go deactive. And at that point, the automation sequence should start to close some doors and push that liquid over here to the left. And then this door here is, is put to the side so that the liquid gets compressed into this area, this area, and that area, giving it a total of one, two, three, four different spots that it can actually evaporate into which is more area than if you were to compress all of this liquid into just these two tiles. Because I don't have anything that says liquid that is stacked 
you know, if, if, if it's on top and one below it, the tile below it can actually evaporate to the left. I have nothing that says it can evaporate to the left, but I do say that if it's in a corner, it can evaporate up and to the left. So that's why I set that up that way. We'll see if that makes any sense. It's a lot of setup, but if you really need to compress down your polluted water, hopefully this works. Both tanks here are holding 7,000 kilograms worth of polluted water. And over here, what I'm going to do is have a hydro sensor. This will just drip into this area very, very simply and start to fill up this floor. And then at that point, this will then flip, shutting off the liquid shutoff. So that you could then essentially have a mini liquid pump that would turn on and run some other stuff. So this could be like using your floor as a storage tank. And like before, I'm going to seed both of these, but with only 100 grams of polluted oxygen. All right, so at this point, I'm going to connect it. The pumps will turn on, and they're going to start to push liquid on over into these little test chambers. Now, I'm not expecting the results to be really directly comparable to the more static tests I did previously. However, this will give us some idea of whether or not either of these setups is actually feasible to do inside of your base. It should expose problems such as potential flooding over here, um, you know, whether this is even a feasible way to store a lot of polluted water. I don't know. We'll see. Okay, so this is interesting. You see this? There's like polluted water bubbling off of this liquid vent. You see that? Look at how much polluted oxygen there is there. Hang on, what's going on here? Right off the bat, I'm seeing something that I was not expecting, but this might be super awesome. Nope, maybe not, it's just an animation. Okay, so, so far both of the tests looks like they're working just fine. And the super compressor is actually doing its job. You can see over here, the liquid drops in and the doors are moving it into their appropriate locations. So over here, you can see that it's 848 kilograms worth of liquid. Another setup is to actually just use like four of these or whatever, you can just kind of just create a little square and then put a liquid vent right there in the middle and then just passively run liquid pipe past it. So that's one option that you could do. You know, maybe I'll explore that later, but <laughs> so both of these are just pumping away. Now the overall area between this and that is actually going to be a little bit different. It's 28 tiles compared to 20 tiles down here. You know, there's only so much I could do because I didn't want to destroy any of these tiles while moving liquid around. But what we can see is we have 2,000 kilograms right here in this location, another 2,000 right there, and 1,300 in that area right there. So now there's no more liquid that's in this area. However, we can see if it will produce more polluted oxygen at a faster rate than what we have down here because it's able to evaporate in more directions. So it's a race now. So we'll let this go for 10 cycles and see what happens. Ooh, who's ready for some interesting results here? All right, so down here on the bottom, we could see that this worked out pretty decently. We pumped it over there, it functioned, and in this area, we have 7.3 kilograms of polluted oxygen. That's pretty good. Above that, we have 5.5 kilograms of polluted oxygen. The area here is actually 29 tiles because this one may or may not have been, you know, filled with liquid. So it, it was one or the other. So it ended up at being 29. Ultimately, what this equates out to is that we started with 7,000 kilograms you know, in both areas here, and then 10 cycles into the future here, we can see that actually more of that in the super compressor test converted into polluted oxygen. So we created 159 kilograms of polluted oxygen in total as compared to 148. So not a big difference. We're only talking about one kilogram per cycle, but hey, it also takes up less space overall when we start to increase that volume above what could fit within one 
single tile. So what we have here is 15.9 kilograms per cycle, and this one is 14.8. Not a huge difference, but if we roll back the clock and let it run again, and what I'm going to do is just continuously pump more and more liquid into this space until they both stop, I think what we'll see is a much different result. I mean, that's what you would expect, right? And another variable I'm going to add to this last test here is I'm going to make this polluted water packed full of germs as if it came straight from a toilet. Okay, so for my last experiment here, I'm I have a lot of these little liquid vents and the liquid should be able to come out of these guys and just fill up that little area right there and then be, you know, uh, the air tile won't let them actually touch anything. So it should be able to just kind of vent all over the place. So we'll see how this works. This is a kind of like an inline solution. So if you were to just to take this liquid pipe and then have it continue and run off and run to some equipment or whatever, you know, this is pretty easy to set up. And it's also really easy to set up your, your uh, deodorizers right here. So that's one, one good option about that. All right, so here we go. Big test. I kind of like this, this is pretty cool. So right now it's just filling up this one spot. Hopefully it'll just continue to go and go everywhere else. Boom, boom. That's pretty dope too. So now that that liquid vent has become overpressurized, it's now moving on to the next location. Cool. And here's another thing, the germ overlay. Yeah, there's a lot of food poisoning down here for the liquid, but the polluted oxygen is not germ, so there isn't any slime lung floating around. Ha 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 ha. I love it. You can just like have your duplicates pee on the floor. All right, so a little ways into this, we can see that this area down here has topped off. The liquid shutoff valve has, you know, stopped it from pumping more into this location. Super compressor, continuing to run like a champ. And now at this, in the same cycle here, we've run out of liquid space up here as well. Okay, so here's an interesting thing. If you look at the polluted oxygen down here, we can see that this is right around 1.5 kilograms. But up top, look at that, 1.8. So spreading it out like this and using this arrangement has increased the amount of polluted oxygen being produced in this area. Obviously you can't use it because you can't just run your dupes through it, but you could convert this into a wall if you really wanted to. Okay, so we can see here the super compressor is just continuing to compress like crazy. Look at that. It's 5,000 kilograms per tile right there. That's 2,000. Yeah. Over a billion germs. Whoa. Check that out. Actually, it's a billion and a half. I would just continue to add to this and add to this, but it's just going to be ridiculous. You get the idea. You can just keep going. All right, you know what? Forget it. Let's just keep adding to it. Because that's cool. Once this finishes up, I'll have pumped a total of 29 metric tons into three tiles. Ah, you know what? I should really just make that 30 metric tons into three tiles. Does that makes that makes sense. It's a 10 to 1 compression ratio. Alrighty, so time for some results. So looking over here at the chart, the compressor test, uh, successfully showed that we can create a super compressor capable of compressing lots and lots of liquid. Ultimately, over 10 cycles, that thing averaged out at 35 kilograms per cycle, which is not bad if it is your primary source of storing polluted water. So that is capable of, in that case, storing 10 times the volume as compared to what it would normally take up. So that's pretty awesome. And it didn't seem like there was anything that said it was going to stop, so... And all my tests show that it can continue to go. However, we will experiment a little bit more with that just to see if we can eventually get it to break, ever. All right, so looking at the charts here, what we can see here is the floor test, which was, you know, more or less the one we saw last time. That produced an average of 15.6 kilograms per cycle. There was a little bit more polluted water because we let it go until the point where the actual valve shut off. So it produced a little bit more than the previous floor test, which had a fixed amount of water that was pumped in. So this one ran until it reached a little bit over 700 kilograms per tile right there. So it produced a little bit more, 
you know, about one kilogram per cycle more, which is exactly what we would expect. The vent test over there with the one that kind of does this little number, that one actually produced 20 kilograms per cycle. So that produced quite a bit more. And matter of fact, that was very impressive when you consider that to the compressor test. Now that compressor test was, you know, added to and added to and added to. So its productivity continued to go up and up and up as we added more and more to it. But it averaged out at 34 kilograms per cycle. So starting from zero to the point where it actually pumped in enough stuff to get 30 tons um, in that three tile space right there was capable of producing again like we saw right there about 35 kilograms per cycle which is awesome not to mention it's a great solution for storing a lot of polluted water in a little space right there not to mention you can also probably set that exact same thing up as a water compressor so you can store clean water and then polluted water in very very small spaces i like that it's pretty awesome we also saw that the germs if they are food poisoning don't turn into slime lungs so that is also awesome as well just to kind of let things play out let's go ahead and just paint in a whole bunch more polluted water into this space we're adding tons and tons and tons of it i love this so since this thing was actually so successful let's go ahead and just take a closer look at it the hydro sensor here the pressure the hydro sensor is set to 500 kilograms so above that it becomes active we then run that to a a buffer gate set to two seconds another buffer gate set to two seconds and then i run that to a filter gate which is going to be set for four seconds so that is you know the opposite of this and then i run it through two more buffer gates both set to two seconds so that is how i run that little cycle right there it takes no power and it just continues to operate continuously like that. Pretty sweet. So let's just disable this for a little bit. I'm gonna go ahead and type in a ridiculous number here. <laughs> and then I'm gonna paint it into each one of these spots. Look at how much polluted water is in that space. And can we continue to add to that? Uh, no. Okay, so it does eventually max out. It looks like at some point here it starts to delete a little bit of that polluted water. Maybe? Unless it shifted over. Oh, no, it just shifted over there. <laughs> that is ridiculous. Oh, we also saw this thing turn on for just a second there in order to let a little bit more polluted water into this space. Because it, you know, eventually got below... 700 kilograms because it was evaporating out into polluted oxygen that is awesome and just look at how quickly this polluted oxygen will go up i mean i have like a uh, an almost illegal amount of polluted water inside of here but look at that boom we just jumped up like 10 kilograms all right one more insight before i actually end this experiment here is that this area is actually not the same as what we have down here it's actually one tile less so up here is 9,000 kilograms so if i real quick just do nine thousand, and then i kind of do some math here to determine exactly how much was happening here okay so what i see here is we are converting polluted water into polluted oxygen at 0.23 percent so it's a little bit above what we first measured in our little static test but still less than 100 degrees celsius and less than what we saw with the direction test all by itself but still a little bit more. So you can use that number to multiply however much polluted water you have to see your potential oxygen production. As long as you take that polluted water, or sorry, that polluted gas, and multiply it by 0.9, because that's how much oxygen you would actually get out of it. So just to wrap things up here, what is our takeaway? Well, there are some arrangements you can use to convert a little bit more polluted water into polluted oxygen. However, the rate is not humongous. You're not going to generate, you know, tons and tons of duplicates worth of oxygen just by pumping a lot of polluted water into 
you know, some space and letting it evaporate. It's more of a passive method, part of a total solution, which might be storing it next to your slime and all of that other things that give off polluted oxygen so that you use a deodorizer at, you know, to convert all of that into nice clean oxygen for your duplicates. The nice thing is that it can be, it can continue to produce more and more polluted oxygen even when there's lots of it already around. So there's no maximum pressure as compared to some other things that we have seen you know, throughout the game. So that's pretty awesome. The super compressor here is uh, massively useful for compressing liquids of any sort. And that arrangement there looks like it works out really good. I mean, obviously you can arrange that in different ways. You don't necessarily need to have this door that way. You can just compress it right over here and it would work just fine. So there you have it, guys. Hopefully you guys have found this video somewhat informative or helpful. Let me know down there in the comment section below if you did. And if I've earned your subscription, then thank you so much for that. On one final note, thank you to all of my Patreon supporters. You guys have been showing me a lot of love over there. And that really helps me kind of get away from the whole adpocalypse sort of thing and potentially kind of plan a little bit more for the future. So thank you so much for that. Have a great day, guys. Stay awesome. Peace. Brothgar, out.